the American worker today. A five-day week. Freedom to belong to a labor union. One of the highest living standards of workers anywhere. How did all this happen? Partly, it's the result of an economy so productive that it can afford to pay its workers well. But also, it's the result of a long struggle on the part of the working man. from Italy. My husband works in a shoe factory. It's a good country, America. A good country. But you got to work a lot here. We make the cigars. My wife, me, and a big boy. We work seven days a week and make 13 cents an hour. Twelve hours a day we work at the machines. Six days a week we get Sunday off. If you stop to rest even for a minute, the foreman notices. Six dollars a week and so many mouths to feed. Oh, my God, what is this land of America? The machine had come to America. It was to revolutionize every aspect of life. In the years after the Civil War, America was developing a railroad network and becoming the greatest industrial power in the world. Farmhouses were being replaced by factories. The landscape of the country was changing. America was becoming a nation of cities, of growing numbers of industrial workers, of immigrants who had left the confines of the old world only to discover the new confines of the American factory. They worked without rights, subject only to the will of the shop owner who could hire the cheapest possible labor for the longest possible hours. Among the cheapest sources of labor were immigrants and children. Millions of children, many younger than 10, worked in the American factory from dawn to dusk. Their pay a few cents an hour. Times are getting hard, boys. Money is getting scarce. If things don't get no better soon, gonna leave this place. Pack up all my children. Take them out of town Say goodbye to everyone Goodbye to everyone If labor tries to organize, 
I can always hire one half of the working class to kill the other half. Jay Gould, railroad millionaire. John D. Rockefeller, clever and ruthless founder of Standard Oil. J.P. Morgan, millionaire banker. Andrew Carnegie, steel baron. This is an age of concentration. If capital is concentrated, labor must be concentrated too. Labor's only chance against the big corporations was to organize. In 1886, Samuel Gompers and Adolf Strasser founded the American Federation of Labor. Appealing primarily to skilled craftsmen, it was to become a powerful voice. In 1893, Eugene Debs founded the American Railway Union. His aim was to forge every man on the railroads into one powerful organization. And in 1894, his new union was to be tested. George Pullman, railroad car manufacturer, decided in that year to slash his employees' wages by 25%. A committee of workers tried to see management. Instead of granting their demands, the company fired three of them. Pullman employees voted to strike. They appealed to Eugene Debs and the American Railway Union for help. We can't let the workers at Pullman go it alone unless Pullman management agrees to arbitrate the American Railway Union will refuse to handle any Pullman car. We'll make this into a national strike. We won't stand by and let an employer starve his employees to death. We'll boycott him into submission. My daddy was a worker, and I'm a worker's son. And I'll stick with the union till every battle won. Tell me which side are you on? Which side are you on? Tell me which side are you on? Which side are you on? The strike was on. A test of labor's strength. Within a day, 15 railroads were tied up. Pullman traffic from Chicago westward was paralyzed. Faced with this challenge, the leadership of the Railroad Owners Organization turned directly to the White House, to the Attorney General, who, conveniently enough, was a member of the board of several railroads. The Attorney General had the ear of President Grover Cleveland and urged him to use troops against the strikers. Cleveland, at first, refused. Newspapers pictured Debs as a clown, a country down the road anarchy. Meanwhile, over a hundred thousand men were listening to him. This has become a contest between the working classes and the money power of this country. But even while Debs was urging the strikers on, the federal courts were moving. A sweeping injunction was issued against Debs and his followers. To back it up, President Cleveland sent in the troops. Deputy marshals, many of them armed and paid by the railroads, guarded the trains. Incensed at the federal intervention, large crowds gathered at the railway yards. And then, the violence began. In a few nights, 30 people were killed and scores of others wounded. The strike was defeated. Don't scat for the bosses. Don't listen to their lies. Us poor folks haven't got a chance unless we organize. Tell me Workers collected their last paychecks and were promptly dismissed. Debs, the bad boy of the labor movement, was arrested. 
side are you on? A blanket federal injunction which he had dared defy now became a powerful weapon against the labor movement. People of wealth could smile again. The Pullman strike had shown clearly that government would line up on the side of business to defeat labor. At the end of the 19th century, America showed all the signs of becoming a class-ridden society. The rich were getting richer, while the working class remained unorganized, powerless. The problems were basic. How was the working man to improve his life? if both his boss and his government were against him. In 1900, a new president came to the White House. Theodore Roosevelt's style was different from Grover Cleveland's, and, as he would demonstrate, so was his attitude towards labor. In 1902, the Pennsylvania coal miners walked out of the mines in a wage dispute. Their struggle, and Teddy Roosevelt's role in it, was to mark a turning point in labor history. It's dark as a dungeon and damp as the dew Where dangers are doubled and pleasures are few Where the rain never falls and the sun never shines It's dark as a dungeon way down in the mine. The leader of the miners was willing to settle the strike by arbitration. But the head of the mine owners was definitely not. The rights of the miners must and will be protected. Not by labor agitators but by the Christian men to whom God has given control of the property interests of this country. Bear's presumptuousness only angered the miners. They determined not to go back to work until they had improved their conditions. Come all you young fellow, so young and so fine. Seek not your fortune Way down in the mine It'll form as a habit And dampen your soul Till the stream of your blood Runs as black as the coal By autumn, the threat of a coal famine hung over the nation. New Yorkers lined up to buy coconut shells for fuel. Theodore Roosevelt determined to move. Enraged by what he called the stupid arrogance of the mine owners, he decided to take over the Pennsylvania mines in the name of the government and start the coal rolling again. The mere rumor of a government takeover of their property made the owners quickly agree to mediation. The result was a federally appointed strike commission which granted the workers a nine-hour day and a 10% wage increase. Roosevelt's intervention was a landmark in American labor history. The first time the government had judged a labor dispute without automatically taking management's side. But once Roosevelt left office, as events would show, the rights of the working man were still far from secure. The 1920s a period of persecution and decline for labor. Organizers came to be thought of as un-American. A radical force which should be rounded up. Zealous officials tried to rat out the communists and anarchists, as they now called labor organizers. Many were seized and deported. But business was booming. Fords were coming off the assembly line one every 15 seconds. Henry Ford was paying his workers more than $5 a day. But throughout industry, it was all a matter of the employer's generosity. In the eyes of management, 
the unions had no right to demand the thing. Few people, however, worried about the problems of the worker. They were too busy having a good time. Then suddenly, it all ended. The worst depression in American history began. I don't want your millions, mister. And I don't want your diamond ring. All I want is the right to live, mister. Give me back my job again. By 1932, roughly one-third of the nation was out of work. I don't want your Rolls Royce, mister. And I don't want your pleasure yacht. All I want is food for my baby. Give to me my old job back. For the first time, vast numbers of Americans knew what it was like to stand in line for a free bowl of soup and a piece of bread. For the first time, the overwhelming majority of Americans sympathized with labor. You people must have faith. You must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite in vanishing fear. We are President Franklin Roosevelt spoke to the nation and tried to calm its fears. And it is up to you to support and make it work. It is your problem, my friends, no less than it is mine. Together, we cannot fail. But the nation was not ready to be calmed. By September 1934, Half a million textile workers in 20 states had gone out on strike. In San Francisco, a strike beginning with longshoremen soon spread to other trades. The city was virtually paralyzed. And still the wave of strikes and violence continued. to labor's problems was needed. Roosevelt promised a new deal. The government would step in on the side of labor. It now became the largest employer in the country. In May 1935, the WPA, the Works Progress Administration, was established. And men desperate for work lined up to receive employment from the government. Millions went to work at newly created jobs. But it was not enough. Despite the WPA and other measures, an army of unemployed swarmed into Washington. The basic problems Unemployment and the right to organize were still unsettled. Agencies were created to help the jobless find work. Unemployment compensation laws were passed in many states. If a man were out of work, he would at least no longer 
be destitute. The Social Security Act gave retiring workers a pension. And in 1935, Roosevelt signed the National Labor Relations Act. Sponsor of the bill was Senator Robert Wagner of New York. The National Labor Relations Bill I introduced is not new in principle. It is based upon a long-cherished American belief that every worker should be a free man in fact, as well as in name, should be free to belong to any kind of union that he likes. My bill guarantees this economic freedom in the clearest terms. Under the Wagner Act, as it became known, labor was at last guaranteed the right to organize. But though the Wagner Act was a labor victory, unionism itself still had not reached out to touch the unskilled or semi-skilled laborer. The coal miners, for instance, as well as auto and steel workers, were still excluded. Unions were mainly for skilled workers. An upstart named John L. Lewis was to challenge this narrow view. Once a coal miner himself, Lewis knew intimately the condition the men faced. He believed all coal miners should be organized into one broad, powerful union. He felt that all unions should be industry-wide, taking in the unskilled as well as the skilled. Lewis's views collided sharply with those of William F. Green, head of the AFL, the American Federation of Labor. Green was determined to keep unions organized along traditional skilled craft lines. With the future direction of labor in the balance, Green and Lewis waged their battle. Will now change from a position of watchful waiting and earnest appeal to the greatest fighting machine that was ever created within the ranks of labor. It doesn't make any difference to the CIO whether he stands with his face to the CIO or his back to it. He looks just about the same whether he's coming or going. Eventually, Lewis broke with the AFL and formed the Congress of Industrial Organizations, the CIO. The first test of CIO's strength was to come in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh town is a smoky old town, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh town is a smoky old town, Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh town is a smoky old town, solid iron from the Keysport down. Pittsburgh, Lord God, Pittsburgh. From the Allegheny to the Ohio, it's Pittsburgh. Allegheny to the Ohio, Pittsburgh. From the Allegheny to the Ohio, they're joining up in the CIO in Pittsburgh. Lord, Pittsburgh. The CIO won victory against the U.S. Steel Company. But when the smaller companies held out, the Union had for a decisive clash. Despite the bloodshed, 
In the end, it was a victory for labor. The National Labor Relations Board eventually forced all the steel companies to recognize the union's right to collective bargaining. In the automobile industry, the CIO was just as successful. After a series of sit-down strikes, the men quickly returned to work. Management had agreed to virtually all the union's demands. There is no other instrumentality available to he who works that can sustain him and render him the assistance in improving his material well-being than the modern labor union of America as exemplified by the Congress of Industrial Organizations. By 1940, CIO membership numbered four million. Labor had become a giant. A strike today. Under law, so long as it is orderly, neither police nor employer can break it up. Labor faces serious problems today. Automation, fewer jobs for unskilled workers. But think back a century ago. Compared to this, the American working class has won a revolution. We're gonna roll, we're gonna roll, we're gonna roll.